relativism. It is one of the most powerful modern philosophic weapons. Its power is immense, however it can become dangerous if wielded to extreme degrees by those with insufficient philosophic understanding. While it can be traced back to ancient times, it is philosophies from five different great philosophers that are noted to have been imbued into this weapon empowering it into the modern philosophic warfare. Relativism is most useful in carving out the layers of presumed objectivity and the naivety of our old ways. We use relativism now as more a clear path to being skeptical about all sorts of claims, not just who makes the best pizza, or even what is right and wrong, but now, even what we may have previously called facts. And so this weapon becomes incredibly crucial for any good philosophic warrior to appreciate its power, but equally important, also its limits. And ignoring those limits can create dangerous and frustrating enemies for us on the battlefield. We must learn to wield relativism, to become good philosophers, to question, to be skeptical of all sorts of claims to objectivity. We must use it whenever it can be used, but we must also be cautious and not be impatient in our journey to investigate cases where perhaps it cannot. The limits of its use. So today we're going to explain those two things, the power and limits of this tremendous philosophic weapon called relativism. Which is why we came here to the battlefield of metaphysics in the first place, so we can dismantle it and see more than merely a blur of all it can destroy to see that it indeed does have limits and indeed does become volatile when those limits are crossed. Limits that we will later point out if it should be crossed by those on the battlefield of the philosophy of science in particular. When when we get back to the battlefield science, if we ever get back. Anyway, we'll be looking at the power and limits as explained and set out in this green book, Relativism by Paul O'Grady. In the last episode, we looked at a battle in this red book, Relativism and Reality by Robert Kirk, because I wanted to make a social point. You see, as it is clearly outlined in all three books I may want to cover on relativism, including this blue book, The Challenge of Relativism by Patrick J.J. Phillips, most find relativism alluring for social reasons. Because we want to be open and tolerant to people of different perspectives, different viewpoints, and understanding from different political spheres, different cultures, races, genders, and so on. But if we jump into it, guns a-blazing as the phrase goes, without sufficient philosophic understanding first, one might hastily end up wielding relativism to an unlimited degree such that one takes the position that everything is relative. Even truth? Yep. Knowledge, truth, reality, everything. And that's what we might call an extreme relativist. So while I personally find those in the pursuit of tolerance not just noble but necessary, I present extreme relativism as a terrible strategy in that pursuit. Now it might sound kind of ridiculous right now, like who would think that say, oh I don't know, that literal scientific facts are relative. It does happen though. It did happen. And probably it still will happen. But we will explain in this video how this weapon appears to become even that powerful as wielded by sophisticated relativists, with seemingly good reasons. In any case, Robert Kirk, in a section of that red book that I have here, took an unsophisticated version of that extreme relativist that's known as the true for me relativist, or if you're fancy, the protagorian relativist. Anyway, for that version of the extreme relativist, there is no truth. There is just whatever is true for me or true for you. So what counts as truth depends on the personal perspective of the speaker. Though at first it may have seemed kind of funny, but we actually encounter people who hold this kind of belief at all levels of society, not just in the philosophy classrooms. People use this to express their truths about politics, religion, and even about literal states of the world facts, and so on, from the newsroom to the bar conversation, arguing over global warming, alternative medicine, or even if the Dragon Eater sports team should have won the Golden Cup. True for me is often used to speak without trying to offend others or tell others that they are wrong for having a different position, 
or perhaps just to hold on to what you believe despite evidence shown otherwise. And I go over a few different reasons why people do this in that Robert Kirk video series, episode 6. Now back in that last episode though, episode 6, in that battle, Kirk shows that this position of saying everything is just true for me or true for you, actually can't support the idea that everything is relative. But also that in trying to defend against Kirk's attacks, the extreme relativist also becomes further committed to a path that leads them to becoming a solipsist. What is a solipsist? It's thinking that you're the only one that exists. That there are no other minds. Just one mind. Just you. Everything else is just a presentation around you. Please check out that last episode if you'd like to see how TFM, true for me, relativism leads to solipsism. But from there, Kirk does show that that too, solipsism, is a position that doesn't support this assertion. And I thought that was a pretty cool philosophic move to do. But then I made my own move to re-explain why true for me or TFM leads to solipsism in my own way. And then that a solipsist's position isn't actually open and tolerant. That actually, while you may have started out as a relativist for those good noble reasons of tolerance and openness that I agree with, that if you stay committed to TFM and become a solipsist, it's actually close-minded, selfish, intolerant position that denies the agency of others and even defies the grasp of the very concept of otherness. Instead of bringing understanding from different perspectives together, they actually become a segregationist of sorts, preventing any real engagement with otherness, thus becoming exactly what they hate, opposing the very heart or organs of why they wanted to be a relativist in the first place. Again, if you think that's kind of interesting and would like to see how all that happened, you can check out that series of videos here. I'll put the links below in the description. And if you were or will be influenced by my move made in that video, well, you know, uh, even though this is a YouTube video and not an academic source, you know, I'm just a shadowy nobody here, but uh, please still credit that video in some way, at least in the footnotes. It's about intellectual honesty, you know? Also, that way, if I say anything wrong and you're influenced by it, others will know why, and blame can also fall on my shoulders. And hopefully that might bring some other philosophers to come battle me over it. And surely one of us will learn something from that battle. Anyway, that version of the relativist isn't actually the more powerful version that philosophers battle against. So I ended up promising that we would go and move on to bigger, badder relativists ones who are actually empowered by arguments from philosophers themselves. Those five that I mentioned earlier are the ones that Paul O'Grady specifically notes. For him, it's actually one of three tendencies that showed up in the different areas of philosophy, pushing out this more modernized weapon. So here we are today looking at the imbuing of this power, the three tendencies that includes ideas from these five philosophers. Briefly, in Paul O'Grady's book, he has a general outline that looks like this. Here we will find the philosophies that helped embolden these relativists and empower that relativist weapon. This is what this video will cover now, the power. Here and here, O'Grady draws the limits of relativism at truth and rationality. Now, on logic, relativism is sort of allowed in the sense that it is allowed on a lower order, but I will explain that later. Relativism, however, for O'Grady, is allowed in ontology. I find this much has to do with the basis of conceptual relativity, but we won't be covering it for our purposes right now. Also, some relativization is allowed in epistemology, but limited by the amount set out in Chapter 5, Limits on Relativism About Rationality. Today though, we'll go over some of that power as I promised. It may seem kind of quick though, because O'Grady seems more about wanting to point out the sources of this power than actually getting into with examples what those sources really are that gave it the power. So hopefully at times I can assist there. Also don't worry if it's a bit fast. In each place, each battle later on that we cover, the philosophic arguments from the actual philosophic thought is often addressed anyway, and sometimes the philosophers are other than these five. But one in particular I will be doing myself. 
in an additional video to help explain so that people really understand why simply thinking literalism or scientific physical descriptions is not actually strong enough to oppose this relativist whose weapon has been empowered by these five philosophers. After that, we'll move on to talk about each of the chapters that include the limits of relativism and the battles therein. So this part, power, may not have much battle itself, but it is a look at that weapon that will be in play in the battles hereafter. Finally, after all this, I will give my overall evaluation of the book, and maybe then I'll touch on some of the chapters that I left out. So let's get to it. Philosophy Battle, the most entertaining presentation of philosophy you'll ever find on the internet, probably. Now entering the battlefield of metaphysics. Oh, light switch. Oh, uh... Uh, I'm gonna keep this off. Hmm. Whoa. That's better. Here is Paul O'Grady. That's not really him. That's just an image I made. Support me on Patreon or uh, make a direct contribution to me on PayPal. Who will give us a little history lesson that will lead us to explaining the powers of this weapon. And to be clear, as he says it in his preface, he's more going to cover this topic in an analytic tradition than a continental one. And also, he's not going to be covering Einstein, which doesn't really have to do with what we're talking about here. Anyway, let's begin. Long ago in the land before time. Oh, okay wait, that was just me, not him. Listen, whenever I'm speaking for O'Grady, it will be cited down to the line on the bottom of the screen, unless I say otherwise. That way, you know I make up nothing. And if I misinterpreted anything, you know exactly which line I didn't do justice. Also, you will know that when I do say something from my own opinion or my own information offered here, you won't misinterpret it as if he were saying it, because then the citation will just disappear when it's me talking, okay? That's how we roll in philosophy battle, citation down to the line. But on the other hand, while I am citing everything down to the line, it will be my interpretation or my paraphrasing of what is being said, unless of course I actually put it up in quotes on the screen and it might be shifted just a tiny bit in order to make sense for this video. Anyway, in the 20th century, there was the linguistic turn in philosophy. Oh wait, so this happened in large part because of a guy named Frege, who kind of tried to make a more scientific or math-like perfect language to do philosophy in. It kind of looked like this. And hopefully we can talk about Frege at length later. But anyway, crudely crunched down for you guys now, basically traditional discussions about what is knowledge turned into what can we say is true. And from that to how can sentences about the world, i.e. propositions, be true? And how do they relate to each other? What even counts as a proposition? Doesn't all information need to be in some sort of language? And if the world is made up of information, is there an inherent language of reality? Or on the other hand, isn't language a tool of communicating among different people? And so this linguistic turn led to a social turn because language brings into the account of the social context that the language is created in. And because there are different societies, previously stable philosophic concepts about truth, meaning, ontology, knowledge, they became unstable. To be clear, I'm dealing not with moral relativism, what's right and wrong, good or bad, I'm interested in cognitive relativism. Relativism about things like truth, reality, and knowledge. Everything that isn't aesthetics, like tastes, or beauty, and art, or morals, ethics, right and wrong. So in my terminology, the opposite of relativism is absolutism. So for O'Grady, relativism is the opposite of absolutism, just as the subjective would be opposite to objective. Just keep that in mind in case an imperfect philosopher uses the term objective as opposite relative instead, as is my preference. I tend to do this. But anyway, saying something is relative is saying that it comes from or is determined or dependent on something else. For example, saying something is big. Big relative to what? To me, or to an ant, or to the planet Uranus. Big is a relative term that depends on something else here. Something absolute 
is independent and doesn't require a relationship to anything else. O'Grady then describes three traditions that in the beginning seemed more unified that later split with little contact in between them. He describes them as the English-based tradition of Russell, Wittgenstein, Ryle, and Austin, the American-based tradition of James, Lewis, Quine, and Putnam, and while they had little contact with each other, they pretty much practically completely left alone the Husserl, Heidegger, Sartre, Derrida tradition, which O'Grady doesn't call that tradition by any particular geographical name, but I would guess on that basis he would call it the continental tradition therefore. Yet some tendencies began to emerge among all sides and aided in the rise of cognitive relativism. Relativism about even those things. Here are three of those tendencies that started emerging independently from different places. Rejecting the theory-practice dichotomy. Rejecting the fact-value dichotomy and framework ideas, which come from those five philosophers. So first, let's deal with rejecting the theory-practice dichotomy. In ancient times, morals, morality, was just as much a part of the world in how the world is. With technological and scientific advancements studying nature though, it left behind questions of behavior and human conduct. The investigation of nature actually pulled apart from that of morality. The discussions of nature became disconnected to that of morals. A split appeared in the kinds of knowledge we had. On the one hand, we had the objective, reliable nature. On the other hand, we had the subjective moral society and religion. So there was a realm of the world that existed independent of us that science investigated and the human world that was dependent on us. Philosophical conceptions developing from this reflected that split between a world independent of human input as reality and a world dependent on human beings like morals, ethics, and behavior. And he says what I suppose as it was taken at the time, that genuine knowledge is knowledge of that which is there independent of our knowing of it, knowledge of what was there anyway. Human knowledge is an effort to adequately capture or represent this reality. Philosophers working within this built a conception of primary and secondary qualities. This is going to sound a lot like the legendary John Locke now. Primary qualities were aspects of reality that were independent of human cognition, like shape, motion, and mass. Things that are taken to be there as they are even if no minds were around to perceive them. And then there were secondary qualities, like color, sounds, and so on. Things that are dependent on our awareness of them. So like vibrations in the air hitting my eardrum technically doesn't need to invoke consciousness, but actually hearing sound does. To this day, these appear to many as fundamentally different things. Like the difference between the mind actually seeing the color red is thought to be fundamentally different, qualia, than the mere detection of say 430 terahertz on the wavelength of the electromagnetic spectrum. So one set of phenomena was part of the furniture of the world itself, and the other are products of products. <laughs> and the other are products of human receptivity and dependent on human cognition. Now it was taken to be that investigations of nature, while helpful to make technology that can be used for certain purposes by our society, that the actual investigation of nature itself was still nevertheless pure for the sake of truth itself. So you know, they felt it was still objective. That sure, we made technology and make use of knowledge for different things depending on our society based on the particular parts of the world we're in or in different periods of history with certain levels of technology and advancement, let's say. But at least practicing the method of gaining knowledge of nature itself, practicing science, was still objective. But then this came under attack from different areas in the 20th century. Scientists are members of society too, like anyone else, influenced by fashion, economics, politics, social status, etc. And also, science itself doesn't actually turn out to be so clear a systemic progression in its study with rules and methods as it turns out. 
history in fact shows us that it's actually full of chance and lucky screw ups. But so what? One may say that despite still living in a messy human world, scientists are still able to pull out the goods, unpolluted, absolute conception of reality. As in the sentiments, yeah, maybe how and why we get the knowledge is relative to the time and society we're in, but still, like, the knowledge itself was still objective, right? Well, to that Paul O'Grady says, there's still a bigger challenge, a massive skeptical challenge. The sentiments that, if such a pure dehumanized picture of reality is the goal of inquiry, how can we ever reach it? Surely we would inevitably infect it with human subjectivity in our efforts to grasp it. Imagine knowledge is like a snowball or something super soft, and we live in a blind world. To know it, we would have to grab it. But by grabbing it, we change sort of what it is. We forced our impression onto it. We can't really know what it is ungrasped. It's always going to be affected, not just in order to observe it, but by observing it by conceptualizing it, by knowing it. Things can't be observed without a perspective from which we perceive. So how could anything be known in ways beyond a particular perspective? One might feel, well, we will never really have knowledge then of reality itself. It will always be infected by us, therefore. Now, there's also a different conception of objectivity, which is intersubjectivity. That is, the objective is just that which the reasonable people agree upon. Well, I'm not gonna touch this for now, but I just want to note there's much to say about this to think of later on. But anyway, still, even with this conception, it involves that for them, while we do get in touch with a reality independent of human thought, but mediated via human thought. Now, what this has to do with relativism is that reality can be mediated in different ways representations of the same objective reality can be different depending on the concepts we use to think about it. Different features of reality come to the fore as we deploy different sets of concepts to deal with it. Quoting here, Philosophers from different traditions such as Wittgenstein, Heidegger, and William James came to hold versions of this view, which are framework ideas but O'Grady will talk about them later more closely. In any case, this all goes against the idea that our practice, or doing science, or anything, is somehow not altered by our theories or our concepts, which are relative to the type of creatures we are, how much we already know, what we are still ignorant of, what time and place our society is based in, etc. And therefore from different societies, it would mean differences in our practice and concepts. But I think this issue is being kind of muddled with the next failing dichotomy. So let's look at that now. Rejecting the fact value dichotomy. The idea of facts is connected to the idea of an absolute conception of reality. As if they are independent, objective, solid, reliable, and is contrasted with the subjective, unreliable things like feelings and desires. One of the big changes is the idea of value no longer being inherently in certain things, like gold, but instead something we project onto certain things, a way human beings have been coloring the facts. So we could split language into a descriptive vocabulary that just says what the facts are, and an evaluative vocabulary that reports how we feel about those facts. This is a fact-value split. Facts are supposed to exist as if independently of the mind, but in order for a human to know a fact, it has to be conceptualized by the human mind. We dress the world in concepts in order to think of it. The world doesn't automatically conceptualize itself. Throughout our own history, we've created concepts to help describe the world. And the concepts we create pick out the things we are interested in. For example, we use concepts related to our senses. Take color. We had color concepts only for the part of the visual spectrum that we can see. Before learning about light and how much bigger the spectrum is, there were no concepts to discriminate the spectrum beyond what we saw. 
So before we may have only thought about, you know, red, green, and blue, yellow, etc. We didn't even have the concepts to differentiate between, say, infrared and ultraviolet, for example, until after we learned more about light. With this, we can still say that there are facts that are either true or false. But what counts as a fact also depends in part on us, both in whether we have concepts to describe it, but also if it even fits with everything else that we already know. We can decide if something counts as a fact or not, if it fits with everything else we already know about the world. Our decision on saying something is a fact is therefore based on a number of considerations that are actually value-laden. Uh, value-laden which means something like soaked in our values, soaked or endowed with our interests. Interests like whether or not it makes our theories more simple, coheres with the facts, allows for greater generalizations, etc. Things that will help us make further predictions. These things aren't in the facts themselves, they're values where human interests enter the picture. Now this alone doesn't make a fact subjective, just what counts as an objective fact isn't independent of the subjective mind. So there's actually two pictures here, an old picture where the world exists totally independent of the human mind constructing anything, and the mind merely mirrors that. And now a more recent picture where the mind is in some way, to some degree, constructing the world that we live in. So this more recent picture allows for describing the world in multiple ways, since people could have different values, thus their accounts of the facts will differ. Now anti-relativists will want to say it can't be varied all that much, there's a limit to how different they can be, and we can work towards unifying a picture of reality. But the relativists focus more on the differences themselves, that they can't unify different versions of the world. And one of the ways that they do this is by using the idea that the world is mediated through a structure that yields different accounts of reality to us relative to that structure. And different terms are used by the relativists for this structure, such as conceptual scheme, paradigm, linguistic framework, and language games. <laughs> oh, sorry, I didn't mean to make that sound too spooky. I'm actually laughing with joy. Because paradigms and language games are two that I feel reasonably comfortable talking about. And the latter is often spooky because of its misunderstanding and again which I feel I can contribute to getting rid of that misunderstanding and misconstruing. But don't worry now, O'Grady is going to explain how these other philosopher framework ideas- Oh sh- okay, oh well I guess we're going straight to the slide this time. So now O'Grady is going to quickly cover some philosophers because he's more so trying to show the similarity in what he calls framework ideas in all of them rather than actually go into depth explaining and giving details of their philosophies. Some of it may then therefore seem unclear to you right now, but just focus on what a framework idea is generally even if you're unclear about a specific philosopher's version. In any case, I'm here for y'all to help fill in some of what might be missing and hopefully a faithful way anyway. Let's start. C.I. Lewis American philosopher C.I. Lewis was influenced by Immanuel Kant's idea that there was a division of knowledge between the given and that which processes the given, to be understood by us I guess. Whoa, wait a minute, maybe we should stop early. I realize Kant seems very much to be the backdrop behind a lot of this, so I'm going to give a sort of one of my visualizations of this kind of philosophic picture here. In this picture, the unprocessed reality outside what is currently grasped by the mind would be this sort of indistinct, undifferentiated grey mush. But really, I can't even say it's grey, I can't even say it's mush. I can't say anything about it. I can only say things about what I do perceive, and this stuff is beyond perception. But whatever it be, if it be at all, it then be processed by our minds through these things called categories of understanding, to produce the familiar perceptions that we do have. So there's a difference between reality, or the pure world in itself, you could say, or maybe we would just make up a new word for it like noumena, and then there's our perception of the world as we perceive it, that reality is processed 
filtered and shaped by our categories of understanding, aspects of our mind, we cut up things to understand the world as the kind of creatures we are that results in our perceptions, what we might call phenomena. And I talk more about how this relates to relativists in my bonus episode for episode 6, where I first introduced this kind of image. So it would be lovely if you do check that out, in fact you might get to appreciate the powers of this philosophic weapon and the sophisticated relativist position to some degree just from that bonus video alone. So again please do check out episode 6, I know it has a lot of parts to it, but hey, it's a fun journey. So anyway, the basic idea for our purposes here is that there is an input from outside our mind and then some processing of the mind happens of whatever that outside input is in order to even perceive what we do. And those perceptions are what we would call observation. In this sense, we don't actually directly observe reality. It's like we have spectacles on. So O'Grady is saying that Lewis was influenced by this sort of picture, which I made sort of loosely generally based on Immanuel Kant. But Lewis was also influenced by pragmatists emphasizing the relation of thoughts to action, you know, actually doing things. Ah, uh, good old pragmatics, that things have value only if they're useful to us to actually do things or survive. It's the spice of American style philosophy. He fused both of these into a position that also denies the theory-practice dichotomy and the fact-value dichotomy. He thought of philosophy as investigating these categories that we use to think about the world, denying that the world conceptualizes itself. Instead, the way we think about reality is socially and historically shaped. Concepts, the meanings that are shared by human beings, are a product of human interaction with the world. Theory is infected by practice, and facts are shaped by values. Concepts structure our experience and reflect our interests, attitudes, and needs. Think about that talk about light going from colors we normally see to now even including ultraviolet, <laughs> violent, uh, ultraviolet and infrared. Or even, and if you're big into history you might get a kick out of this, but Blue was not recognized as a unique color concept until practical societal reasons came about. More often in our cross-cultural history, we find the color concept that combines what we now consider green and blue. But as it seems to me, the most popular theory goes that we only began to use the color concept of blue uniquely after we became capable of making blue pigment in ancient Egypt a color which was otherwise very rare in nature itself, and perhaps it's just that blue did not require being uniquely identified prior to that. Anyway, back to Lewis though. The categories we use aren't from reality itself, but reflect enduring human interests. In that way, reality is relative to a system of concepts. The world as we know it is shaped by the concepts we use to interpret it. Experience though governs which system of concepts we use in respect to which ones are successful. Faulty and useless concepts lead to bad predictions and unsuccessful courses of action. It's come to my attention that I may want to make something clear here, even though I have already said it, but I'm gonna say it again, but I'm not saying this grey mush is what's actually there, that reality is actually grey mush. Really, I don't know if it's grey, and I don't know if it's mush, it's just that I can't say or talk about it at all. And Kant's categories make it even difficult to even say that it is. So there are different ways to interpret this that we will talk about later, especially if we cover chapter 3 on ontology. And I don't really know Lewis directly actually, I only know what O'Grady says about him here, but he does say much later on in a different chapter that Lewis nevertheless does take the given as data of the senses upon which we build knowledge. So this is just what it seems to me right now. But it's more simply the eyes do very much still pick up this visual light input, let's say, but whatever this light reflections mean to us, in order for it to mean anything, in order for it to be even be information in a sense at all, it has to do with our concepts. So this is as it appears or is given, but then it's still the concepts that cut it up meaningfully. So really there is all this. Then we have say a concept of saying something is edible and that cuts this out. And of course therefore I guess a concept of the non-edible 
and maybe we have the concept of things from nature, and also things that are constructed from and for humans. And then we have concepts to identify colors. So it's really that concepts are cutting up all this information that there is from the given. And for Lewis, those concepts themselves are a social product. Certainly children are taught to recognize the type of things that are edible and not. And certainly children go through a process of recognizing the type of things that are just there in nature and the kind of things that humans must have made. These concepts came into being and survived among any number of concepts because they help us survive or accomplish goals ourselves. So that's my example of what's going on here. I bring this up just to be clear that with both of these, the given or input doesn't necessarily mean that there isn't something. If anything, scientifically, it is nigh infinite information in a sense, if there even is such a thing as information at that stage. And it isn't simply just gray mush. I'm just visualizing it like that. That whatever is presented to the mind cannot be thought of or talked about or even recognized without concepts to cut it up out of the rest of everything else. That's just one interpretation of what's going on, but don't worry about it too much right now. We're just trying to grasp this idea that we're actually contributing to what we observe. Anyway. So the framework idea for Lewis are systems of categories by which we mediate reality to ourselves. For Lewis, these categories are almost as much a social product shaped by our society as language itself is. This is kind of different from earlier Kant whose categories appeared to be an attempt at more of a universal description of how the human mind must conceptualize reality in order to understand it. But from Lewis, these categories are socially constructed from our social environment that you are in. While Lewis really didn't talk much about how this would mean that there could be different sets of categories therefore, he has acknowledged the possibility on occasion. And we can see that different categories would mean that the world as it appears to us would be different in a sense according to different societies. If a different society can lead to different categories, that leads to different ways the world appears to us as. At least what we can say about what we observe picking out or even recognizing only certain things we have the concepts our society has provided to pick out or recognize. But anyway, there is no unmediated access to reality itself. And the only curbs on the system of categories would be pragmatic ones for Lewis. So possibly having different sets of socially constructed categories, that's what O'Grady calls Lewis's framework idea. A presentation of the world comes with it a certain set of categories from which it was processed. A framework. Now let's move to Rudolf Carnap. Sharing a lot of the same sources with Lewis, German philosopher Rudolf Carnap articulated his framework idea of linguistic frameworks that was super relativistic. He was also influenced by Kant thinking that our knowledge is a result of some kind of processing and shared the idea of pragmatic value of applying one's knowledge. But he was also influenced much by science as that which constitute actual knowledge and as a force therefore to get rid of metaphysical and theological fake knowledge. This is a kind of deflationist view of philosophy where instead of talking about things like truth and reality, Philosophy should just clarify meanings for scientists. Doing that too may have seemed itself another discussion of philosophical truths, but when it came to certain things in philosophy like what is really real, these kind of questions seemed unanswerable in a way that questions in science could be answered. So instead philosophers should just focus on investigating and creating these models, which are like languages and systems where one can calculate and identify things with clear meanings, logical implications, and criteria for confirmation so that scientists can then go on and actually do the research using these models. This was to deflate philosophical questions into merely practical choices of which model scientists wanted to use. So central to Carnap's project is this notion of frameworks. Frameworks for Carnap outline all the rules using the terms and relations between the terms. So number terms can be introduced and have a relationship 
or rules based on that relationship within the framework of math, let's say. So for example, in my interpretation of this, it means that 5, 7, and 2 within the framework of math, 5 has a relationship to 7 being a difference of 2. You can add 2 to 5 and get 7 or subtract 2 from 7 and get 5. Those terms have a relationship and they are clear in the framework of math. Relative to that framework, questions about numbers are easy. These kind of questions about the relationships, like what is 9 plus 8, they are internal questions. Questions that presuppose the existence of such a framework to get an answer. Relative to the framework, internal questions are uncontroversially answerable. And there are different frameworks to discuss different kinds of things. Physical objects, properties, or spatiotemporal objects. Do numbers really exist? Do properties really exist? Carnap calls these external questions because they are outside the context of a linguistic framework. Such questions are improper because the choice of framework is pragmatically decided on. If it is useful to speak of numbers, then such a framework will be used. If it is useful to speak of properties, then that framework will be used. The only appropriate external questions are ones about the expediency of using a framework or not. So pretty much within this linguistic frameworks, questions are answered easily within the structure of that framework. But to try to step outside a framework and discuss it itself, the only meaningful question here is if that framework is useful us to use right now or not. But still, this can lead to a huge number of frameworks. So Carnap points to a kind of natural selection, akin to biology, to how we come to use particular ones, reducing how varied they can be. But even with natural selection, there's still a lot open here for relativists. But let's leave that there for now. Carnap will come up again in the battle, and we will cover again sort of what the idea is. So anyway, that's what O'Grady calls Carnap's framework idea. And now, for LW. Ludwig Wittgenstein He's probably the most important developer of framework ideas of the 20th century, and is well known for making two influential philosophies. Whoa, wait a minute. Uh, so to be honest with you, I do not think this section is very good at explaining what Wittgenstein's framework idea is, even less so than any of the other philosophers. The framework idea of language games has less time devoted to it than the other things. And yet it's very important to grasp this idea in particular, especially considering O'Grady himself thinks he's the most important contributor to it. But also, it could be very helpful for us in the future as well. So I want to make clear it's not that Paul O'Grady has gotten Wittgenstein wrong in this section or that O'Grady cannot do a better job at explaining him or isn't so much smarter than me, but that this particular section doesn't really explain what a language game really is and how it leads to the other points that O'Grady brings up. So I will do that myself, explain it in a separate video. A video that's just off the cuff, you know, not cited from the top of my head, just me trying to explain with examples what language games are and how it connects to the points that O'Grady is going to be bringing up for the purposes of just getting the idea out there to move on. But hey, maybe it could also be a great standalone video if you've kind of forgotten what Wittgenstein's language games were kind of about. At least until I do make a proper video, since we definitely will get into Wittgenstein properly one day and I promise to give away all my secret stash of important citation. Everything cited down to the line like I normally do, you know, even back to his blue and brown books where we will find a cheat code, okay? But for now, let's see what O'Grady does say anyway. O'Grady tells us that Wittgenstein had two influential philosophies, one presented in his Tractatus Logical Philosophicus that articulates what essentially language is, you know, its essence, and the picturing relation between language and reality. Now, O'Grady doesn't say what he thinks Wittgenstein said is the essence of language, but I think it's simply that it has this picturing relationship. That language is that which corresponds to reality, like a picture does, with words and a proposition having the same relationship to each other as the objects that they pick out or stand for in the world. The other philosophy later in life, his latter philosophy, is presented in his philosophical investigations, and it actually critiques a lot of what was said in that first account, rejecting the idea that language has a particular essence. 
and that philosophy shouldn't focus on advancing theses, but be a kind of therapy to help clarify language. Instead of having a single determinate language, language is comprised of many language games. Now I'm just gonna read like six lines and tell you what I think of them. A language game is a complex whole of verbal usage and associated activities. Words simply don't label or stand for objects, but relate to each other and the world in highly complex ways. Words are like tools. There are many different kinds, performing many different kinds of activities. Therefore, there are many different language games, and many different associated forms of life, the kinds of activities associated with the language game. The language games are governed by grammatical rules. Rules of grammar prescribe the modes of representation by which the world is represented to us. Oh, super clear, isn't it? No. Look, I don't think O'Grady is wrong, but only because I actually studied Wittgenstein. But also, I haven't forgotten what's wrong with talking about Wittgenstein like this, in part because I haven't forgotten what it was like as a young philosopher that was unfamiliar. I think this could, to someone less familiar, make Wittgenstein seem complicated or even mystical in some sense, neither of which is true. The last lines in particular could seem to imply something radical, like what you say changes the world itself that reality, as commonly taken, is literally changing when you change what you say. That's kind of extreme if you think about that kind of picture, and not at all what Wittgenstein's about. Though it's hard to say, but also to deny, what Wittgenstein's actual metaphysical position really is, because he himself won't do that, since his philosophy aims to stop speaking metaphysically in such a manner in the first place. But if you insist to be unfaithful to his philosophy, there is still a cheat code in the blue and brown books, like I said, that I can give you later, so subscribe. <laughs> in any case, I can imagine someone reading this and just feeling like, oh whatever, just another philosopher using a bunch of words together to obfuscate their position to appear deep and complicated but it's just vague nonsense jargon. So this is why I believe my video becomes necessary for anyone who hasn't studied Wittgenstein's language games already, because you're not going to get a good sense of it from O'Grady, despite what it may seem like other actual philosophers say, for someone new and not familiar with the kind of concepts that philosophers use all the time, this really isn't easy text, and I definitely think Kirk's book was probably much more palatable to somebody new. In any case, there are a couple of more things that O'Grady does point out about language games, Wittgenstein's framework idea, that are important, so let's cover them. O'Grady points out three things, and two of them are that Wittgenstein emphasized that it was important not to conflate one language game with another or to think that there are super language games that govern all others. O'Grady also points out that there is a quite popular use of Wittgenstein's idea was to try to defend religious belief against rationalistic critique by claiming that religion is its own language game and that it is illicit to use criteria from another language game, usually science, to challenge it. But as it is always really important to point out, this is not to say that Wittgenstein himself espoused such views. Again, as I said, that he didn't mean and likely didn't want his philosophy to be used by extreme relativists, especially considering how he was trying to be anti-philosophy in his own way, but his views lent themselves to such use. O'Grady then talks about how in Uncertainty, Wittgenstein's latest writings, that Wittgenstein does seem to have this image of a riverbed with a bedrock below to kind of represent even how in a language game, there are beliefs that we are willing to change more easily and fluidly and some more deeply entrenched which are like the bedrock at the bottom of a river. But that even those can change, just at a much slower rate. O'Grady brings this up to kind of say how it's this bedrock beliefs that are the framework upon which the fluid beliefs depend. And that this for O'Grady is also used to say the framework may alter and indeed there may be alternative frameworks. But really he didn't need to bring that up at all. I think the fact that there are different language games is enough to see how Wittgenstein's philosophy empowers the relativists. In fact, as far as I have seen, the issue of whether the bedrock can change from within a language game isn't a discussion that the relativists using this weapon even bother with. It's seemingly to me always a discussion about how there are differing language games. But maybe I'm missing something as to why he felt this was important to bring up. I mean, I guess there's another argument to how there can be different frameworks, but really the language game argument, not the bedrocks can change argument, is ultimately what's taken to be the power that is imbued into this weapon from Wittgenstein. Now I do wish O'Grady would have done, don't think, look, 
more, which is give more examples for us to actually look at in many places in his book. But as I said in the beginning of the video, Paul O'Grady does seem to be more concerned with pointing out the sources of the powers of this weapon rather than actually explaining what the sources are, which is why I said I would try to hopefully fill that gap and bear that responsibility myself. So again, please do go check out that video that I will be making. I will definitely be more clearly explaining what the idea of a language game is, and I will explain why we would be against the idea of a super language game, and why we shouldn't mix language games, as well as how these kind of Wittgensteinian philosophers may be in a tight spot sometimes if one is trying to stay faithful to his philosophy while explaining it. Anyway, please check out that video. So now I'm going to give things back to O'Grady who will talk about W.V. Quine. W.V. Quine was one of the earliest to popularize the phrase conceptual scheme. The conceptual scheme is revisable, but there is no neutral position. To talk about the world is to apply some conceptual scheme to it. From childhood growing up, we learn the conceptual scheme. And as we learn more, the conceptual scheme gets refined. And right now, science is the best as the most inclusive scheme that covers everything that exists. It is the best to understand the world and predict changes in it. But borrowing the term language game from Wittgenstein, Quine says that there are other kinds of language use for poetry or fiction, for example, and they are used to see the world in a different way, imaginary worlds. So of course they'd have different conceptual schemes, which is fine. But what if it's the same world, like the real world? Can we nevertheless have different conceptual schemes? Well, it seems there's enough in Quine to say yeah, for sure. For example, he believes that all beliefs can in fact be changed, that none are unchangeable and absolute, that there are no a priori beliefs for Quine. But what that even means could use some further detail, but it's in a different chapter that again, I'm not sure if I'm gonna cover exactly. But also, he did believe in underdetermination of theory by fact. Which is to say that any set amount of evidence could support more than one theory. So with my famous example I used in the Map of Philosophy of Science video, check it out if you have time, there I used an example of dots on a graph that I give, with the dots representing observations, or even what counts as evidence for. Any certain amount of dots can support more than one theory of what the shape the dots are making. And in fact, no amount of dots will ever fully guarantee only one shape, or theory that could fit it. So it would be like Quine does believe that even in dealing with the real world, people could nevertheless have different conceptual schemes. These two things, that all our beliefs can change, so our conceptual scheme can change, and that we can have different theories based off the same observation, thus different conceptual schemes while based in the real world, would make Quine fertile ground for relativists. But we'll talk later in chapter 3 whether that's actually his position or not. Chapter 3. Chapter 3. Whoa, okay, so we can stop with that. Look, I don't know if we're really gonna be covering that. What? Okay, fine, we'll see. Anyway, O'Grady is calling Quine's conceptual scheme, which is like our best theory of the world, that we use to make sense of the world, which can change and can be different, Quine's framework idea. Now finally, drop that coon. Hold on! Okay. Uh, a philosopher and historian of science, T.S. Kuhn, helped relativists in a big way. His notion of paradigms, not paradigms, became influential well beyond philosophy of science. A paradigm is a context within which scientific inquiry proceeds, like assumptions, training methods, standards, goals, methods of experimentation. Again, O'Grady doesn't provide examples, even in places where they would be super helpful, but I would just say maybe it would be helpful to imagine a Newtonian paradigm, let's say, versus an Einsteinian paradigm, you know, a paradigm of relativity, or now say a quantum physics paradigm. They characterize a scientific community at a stable period, but a crisis can happen that lead to a new paradigm. The paradigms themselves, though, are supposedly incommensurable. Paradigms create their own context within which it rationally operates. 
so one can't rationally judge or decide between them. Here's where I think there's some leftover blood-soaked soil of the positivists that have us thinking of it like that, which I mentioned in that map episode. But yeah, think of it as in that evidence is interpreted through a paradigm. So then it isn't evidence that's actually deciding between paradigms. We can't evaluate the evidence without a paradigm first. So each paradigm judges itself, and one cannot judge a paradigm from another based on evidence itself. Now I have actually created two videos on Kuhn already. One video is Kuhn's response in his own words to those that contrast him with his predecessor, the great champion Karl Popper. So it gives I think a decent outline of what Kuhn's position is. But also I made a video explaining in much more detail how it is specifically his philosophy that allowed these relativists therefore to enter onto the battlefield of the philosophy of science, using his philosophy of paradigm shifts and crises. If you're interested, please check them out. The second video can be a bit spooky, it's called the gates of hell, but uh, I'm just being dramatic, don't worry, hell isn't really involved. In any case, it's these philosophers that are the big names of whose philosophies are similar enough in terms of a framework idea to be pressed into a single weapon, and a nearly supremely powerful position the relativist takes wielding this great weapon. Framework ideas from them developed from very different places of the world, and was one of the three big trends that brought forth this weapon into the modern philosophic battle, according to O'Grady. But I think he is missing a couple of other things, namely that there's also a lot of scientific discoveries that led to similar beliefs about how what we perceive isn't objective reality, that it is shaped by the type of creatures that we are, with the faculties that we have. Brain science shows all the ways we filter out non-essential information, and what counts as essential again has to do with our evolved histories as human beings, again such as what kind of colors we can see in the light spectrum, and even many people's beliefs and interpretation of what quantum physics supposedly shows us evidence for that our act of observing itself affects the observed. Not that I believe that interpretation, but it is one that many more people have been taking on because of quantum physics. Of course though, O'Grady is talking about philosophy, but I do think philosophical conversation is obviously being influenced by discoveries and technological advancement in science in modern times as much as it was in his own little history lesson given to us here describing the separation of nature and morals. The battle. So, we may find ourselves up against an enemy wielding this weapon in an extreme position. Let's say because we are endorsing the use of science to decide on the role of vaccines, the reality of global warming, or the age of the earth. We can actually believe that this position of wielding this weapon to an extreme degree of thinking everything is relative was created not because they are evil and want to attack science. We may believe that they are actually sincere in their honest virtuous morals of pursuing tolerance and open-mindedness of people of different perspectives and are weary of western imperialist thinking, of having used claims of rationality and logic and scientific advancement as a reason to oppress and invalidate others of non-western belief systems. But of course it's that same extreme position that can be used to defend attacks from science against the intolerant, abusive, tyrannical belief systems that will say science is just relative so it cannot be used to attack their abusive beliefs that aren't grounded in reality but dogma and deep-rooted insecurities, like misogyny or homophobia. So taking this weapon as if it were infinitely powerful isn't in the best interest of even those who are primordially interested in a more tolerant social world. And there is real world evidence cases about this, but we'll talk about them later. In any case, we as good warriors on the philosophic battlefield should wonder how, if I do come up against an enemy wielding this weapon to an extreme degree, enough to attack science, claims to truth or rationality, let's say? then how am I supposed to beat them when I want to say something is science, when I want to say something is the truth, when I want to say something makes rational sense? So think about it. Against this enemy, I cannot just take something out of my pocket and say, see, this is the objective thing here. It's not relative. 
because everything I say is merely relative to a language game. I can't show any evidence either, because evidence is relative to a paradigm. And I can't even show any observation of anything, because all observations are structured relative to our conceptual scheme. There isn't anything I can produce, anything I can offer, that cannot be attacked by this enemy. So it's difficult to figure out how can I beat this enemy when they can attack anything I show them. If I say objects or reality, they can even say that those are just in fact words relative to a language game. Even if I try to be very clear that I mean mind-independent reality, they can still attack that and say whatever mind-independent reality even means is structured by a conceptual scheme tied to particular social groups that make use of such conceptual structures, thus hastily concluding that reality is relative. So yes, it is incredibly frustrating trying to deal with this kind of enemy who will continually attack constantly. So I want you to remember this situation, facing an enemy that will always attack no matter what is shown. How can you win? Think of it for yourself first. Do you see a way we could deal with this kind of enemy? Can you come up with a cool move or a counter? Think about it before we get to the next video, where we will cover what Paul O'Grady does on the battlefield choosing specific areas to defend against charges of relativism. This weapon, however, made by philosophers, is being wielded to attack science. Not by philosophers themselves, but by sociologists who used Kuhn to enter onto the battlefield of the philosophy of science in order to attack it. And these sociologists do not understand this weapon well enough to grasp the dangers if it is used as if unlimited. They only know its power to attack the attempt to speak with authority, not the limits. Which we, unlike them, will learn in the next videos. Once we learn that this weapon does in fact have limits, and the dangers that happens when those limits are crossed, we will then return back to the battlefield of the philosophy of science, where they had these science wars. The battlefield from where I came in this journey. And then we will take on this particular group of sociologists that are attacking science, or those influenced by them, called the SSK, who started the science wars. So if you would like an account of what led to the science wars and who are these SSK, please watch my video Voodoo Sociology, as Paul O'Grady now prepares for battle himself against this extreme relativist, presented in the next video. One that attempts to make a few attacks on objectivity by proclaiming that even truth is relative.